social and environmental issues of public concern, especially in her home state of Goa. Over the past two decades, she has argued pro bono over 100 public interest litigation cases, tirelessly taking up issues concerning environmental pollution, animal rights, women's issues, etc. She was also instrumental in obtaining judicial orders banning the killing of stray dogs and cruel sport of bullfighting in Goa. During the mid-90s, she started a Goa branch of the People for Animals. In 2002, Norma was awarded the Padma Shri for her work for the protection of animals and the environment. Mr. Anand Grover is a senior lawyer known for legal activism in Indian law relating to homosexuality and HIV. Along with his wife, Ms. Indira Jai Singh, he is the founder member of the Lawyers Collective. He was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right of the health from August 2008 to July 2014. He is currently an active, acting member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. He is also known for representing cases of, from animal, uh, animal cases in various high courts and Supreme Court. And last, Suparna Ganguly. Ms. Suparna Ganguly is the co-founder trustee of CUPA, the Compassion and Unlimited Plus Action, and also the Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center, WRRC. Suparna's insights and opinions of captive elephants in India are based on her extensive research, documentation, and inspections of elephants in private holdings. Her findings, insights, and opinions are widely published in 2005 in the book titled Gods in Chains, which subsequently inspired the making of the film Gods in Shackles. Since 2006 and ongoing, Suparna has been involved in the reporting of the welfare and veterinary status of captive elephants under private ownership and various management regimes across the country. In March 2016, Suparna received the pre prestigious Nari Shakti Puraskar 2015 from Honorable President of India on the occasion of International Women's Day in recognition of her exemplary and torch-bearing efforts. Over to the panel. Okay, uh, look, we want some silence in the hall. Uh, people at the back, people at the back, stalls at the back, please close your stall for the moment. Look, uh, this is not a topic in which everyone may be interested, but it's an important topic which we bring for, uh, at this conference. So if you are uh, uh, not interested or you want to talk to somebody else, which is really fine, we only request you to leave the room and talk outside. It's very difficult otherwise to concentrate on this. Thank you so much. Okay, so the topic is legal personhood of elephants. It is a new topic. It's a new subject. Not many people have thought about it. Not many people may be interested in it also. And the reason why we are looking at this topic of legal personhood of elephants is because we are interested in the protection of their rights and their interests. <clears throat> Do they have rights? We don't know. Does the law give them rights? We don't know at this point in time. Do they have interests? Of course they do. They have more interests than pain, avoidance of pain and cruelty. They have more interests than that. And we think and we believe that if we look at personhood for elephants, if we look at personhood for elephants, and if we are able to make this case out and argue our case out, then we would be able to protect the rights and the interests of elephants. At present, we have the PCA, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, whose ambit basically is avoidance of cruelty, avoidance of pain and suffering. It is to that extent limited. It's all we have, but let's admit it is limited. But fortunately, as Justice Radhakrishnan said this morning, we have several judgments of the Supreme Court made in the interests of human beings which have expanded the right to life to include the right to environment. And into this right to environment, 
without which you cannot have a meaningful right to life, into that environment, we have smuggled in the animals. So we have got the animals in by saying, well, animals are part of the environment, and therefore, by indirect inference, animals also should, uh, should have some kind of protection. Justice Radhakrishnan also brought two points out in his very passionate speech this morning. One, he said, it is our duty to cultivate humaneness. He referred to Article 51A-H of the Constitution. Humaneness which goes beyond compassion and kindness. He said this is what he relied on in his judgment, which, was, which is the main judgment that we also all speak of. The second thing that he talked about was the shift from anthropocentric to ecocentric, which is a shift from everything is based on what humans want. We are the masters of the universe. Our interests are paramount. Shifting it to ecocentric, where human beings are part of the universe, where there's more than just man, woman, and child. There are a whole range of animals, beasts, fish, birds in the air, and so on. And on these two principles, he based his landmark Nagaraja judgment, which, as I said, is we are now renowned for. But I must tell you that, according to me, I know of a judgment 20 years earlier, which my good friend Anand Grover argued. I don't know whether he was interested in animal law. I think he was, at that time, um, labor law. So how he got to it, I don't know. But he argued a, argued a case for camels in Mumbai. There were camels were on the beach, and they were doing joy rides. And in that judgment, perhaps innocuously, I don't know, because thinking was not so advanced perhaps then. And that judgment speaks of the integrity of the animals. The court said that animals are desert animals. How can they be moving around in Juhu Beach, which is obviously not desert, which is very much moist, which is sea, which is completely alien to them. So he spoke of integrity of the animal, spoke of a suitable environment. You can't just take some animal from somewhere and dump them somewhere else. You can't take elephants from somewhere and put them somewhere else. It must be suitable to them. We can't arrange climate the way we want. Climate is what you get in a particular place. And it also talked that the right to life includes quality of life. So in my mind, that is the beginning of where Nagara reached 20 years later. July 1996, camels, joy rides in Mumbai, and 20 years later, almost 20 years later, you have the landmark Nagara judgment. We have, so to speak, breasted the tape. We have come up to a particular point. We now want to push the limits. We believe, we, and when I say we, I mean FIAPO, we believe, is it not time for animals to be recognized as persons? We are asking the question, is it not time for animals to be recognized as persons? Because as persons, you get rights, you get your interests are protected, and you can represent. Who will speak for the animals? That's the question which Justice Radhakrishnan also put forward. He said, I decided to speak for the animals. So you can represent your case. Why have we chosen the elephant? Well, actually, we, we want all animals to be recognized as persons. But we are a little shrewd. If we say all animals will get thrown out at the start, they're going to say, no, 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 nothing of the sort, out you go. So we are being a little shrewd, and we have decided to take symbolically one animal. And we've chosen the elephant. We think it's a good symbol. It's a large symbol. If we had chosen the earthworm, we would have to magnify it many times to put it up on the screen. So we've chosen something large. We've chosen something which is very representative of India, which everybody recognizes as Indian. And I won't go into all the reasons. Suparna will deal that with that later. So the, this issue, this session, is about a constitutional issue. It's not about whether elephants are being treated badly in some temple or on the road or begging elephants or whatever. So we are looking at a legal, a constitutional issue. 
And the questions which we want to ask, and I hope Anand will answer them, is what or who is a person? We know that we are persons, but is there anybody else who's a person? What does personhood mean? What are its implications? Can we get rights? Can personhood be to a limited extent? These are the questions that we are asking. We also want to know, and that's from you as well in the audience, your suggestions on how we could go about it. If we can get personhood status for elephants, how do we go about it? What ideas do you have? Suparna will talk about the, why the elephant was selected and a few others. She will respond to Anand as well. So we have 45 minutes in this session. I have taken five minutes already. I've taken 15 minutes. No, not fair. Okay. Uh, so I would, like, I would like to give Anand maximum time because he's come a long way from Delhi. He has argued the case for very disadvantaged people HIV, LGBT, and so on, and he will know how we could put across this case. So Anand would talk, hopefully, for 15 minutes, good enough? All right, so I'll give him as much, I want to give him as much time as he can. Suparna said she'll talk very briefly, and five, five minutes, and then we'll put it across to you. Hopefully, we'll finish within the time. Thank you. Okay, so what is personhood? Very simply, personhood is an entitlement for a person to go to court in his or her or transgender person's name and protect his rights and sue for a remedy and be sued in turn. That's the basic minimum. But I want to just add, after our friend Ashish Kuthari spoke, and I already anticipated that, uh, we need to actually have personhood of animals in the context of our understanding of nature, animals, and human beings. What is the precise relationship that should exist between these three? That is for you to decide. Uh, obviously, human beings are not independent, though theoretically they were meant to be for a long time in history because of the way historical development took place. And basically, there has to be mutual respect of all three. And that is the basis of sustainable. Now, historically, if you look at it, uh, during the British period, they were seen, animals were seen as subordinate, benefiting human beings, which is reflected in the original PC Act, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1890. Then, after the Constitution was uh, enact, uh, came into force, there was a very significant change. Chapter 4A directive principles were engrafted, and 51. A, G, and H were actually included, and they talked about showing compassion to living creatures as also humanism. I'll, I'll touch on the issues that Just, Justice Radha Krishna talked about, but the PC Act, which exists today of the 60s, is basically preventing unnecessary cruelty to animals, and it has to be understood in the context of 51A. But that section of the, and the provisions of PC Act they actually also cast duties on human beings, therefore corresponding rights on animals. Who, who sues for animals? Tudafiapo sues for animals. They can't sue in their own name because they do not have a personhood. Now, just to give you an example, in admiralty law, suppose I want to sh uh, sue for, if I'm a ship, shippy, I'm working on a ship, if I want to sue my employer, who's the ship owner, I have to sue the owner and the ship, who in a language of uh, uh, admiralty law is a she. So she also will be made a party because ships have personhood. Okay? So that's how it is. That's the simplest meaning of a personhood, that you can sue and be sued in your own name. But we have to go beyond that. Today, Fiapo can sue on behalf of animals, but can an elephant called A sue in his or her own name? That will be the question. Now, so therefore, we have to go beyond the statutory rights. They have rights today under the PC Act, but those rights are limited. It's based on welfareism, and as I said, prevention of cruelty and prevention of unnecessary pain. But this moved because of the notions 
that were uh, indicated in the World Organization of Animal Health. And in fact, they included a very significant thing. Animal is in a good state of welfare, as indicated by scientific evidence. If it is healthy, comfortable, well-nourished, safe, now very importantly, able to express innate behavior. What does that mean? For example, battery chickens. If the chickens are in a cage, they can't even turn around. They can't express the innate behavior. Therefore, they suffer. That's the point. Now, basically, in terms of that uh, international declaration, the basic minimum are the physical conditions, which you know the five freedoms. I'm not going to read them out. But one very important one, which is the fifth one, is the freedom to express from normal patterns of behavior. This is the same thing. Now, in India, there was a very significant change. And I want you to note that if you have to move forward. And unfortunately, Justice Radha Krishna is very modest. And I told him, I said, the most revolutionary thing in his judgment, he forgot to mention. And I'll talk about that. And that is the concept of dignity. Okay? And he mentions that in his judgment. That is the revolutionary part. And he says that even human beings have dignity, but also animals, okay? This is not anywhere else in the world. This is a constitutional thing. Now, what is the concept of dignity? Now, we have a very important part of our constitution, which is Article 21, the right to life and liberty. And that's at the bottom. It actually talks, it's actually, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm not putting it there, I think. No, it is there. No person shall be deprived of his liberty or life without procedure established by law. So it tells the state, I cannot take you into jail or I cannot take your life unless there is a law and there is a procedure. Okay? Now, this issue, what does it mean, came up in a very famous case called Frances Corali Malin, who was an Irish prisoner who was in jail and she wanted books and reading material. The jailer said, sorry, you are a prisoner, you can't have books. She went to the Supreme Court. She, they said, no, a person doesn't only exist in the basic necessities. It's not mere animal existence, but it is with dignity. And dignity means that you have all wherewithals that require dignity or dignified life. So you can have books. And that provision, Article 21, which was a negative injunction on the state became the positive obligation of the state. All issues of environment, health are based on that. So this is very, very important. So, and this is what Justice Radha Krishnan has said in his judgment. Every species has a right to life, okay? And security, subject to the law of the land, which includes depriving its life out of human necessity. So I can take the life of an animal only on one condition. That is, if there is necessity for me to live. If that comes in a clash, then only human beings are superior. Otherwise, and that's a balance that he had to strike. Article 21 of the Constitution, which while safeguarding the rights of humans, protects the life and the word life, has been given an expanded definition. Any disturbance from the basic environment, which includes all forms of life, including animal life. So indicated that, which Norma emphasized. But the most important part is the third point. So far as animals are concerned, in our view, life means something that more than mere survival or existence or instrumental value for human beings, but to lead a life with intrinsic worth, honor, and dignity. So animals are also entitled to live a life with dignity. This is a revolutionary concept in constitutional law. Which means what? For elephants, what is the meaning of that? Now, at the moment, we have issues, which Suparna is going to talk about. I'm not going to go into detail. We have a law on PC Act which deals with that. And so far as wild animals are concerned, there is a Wildlife Protection Act. Now, there have been a number of judgments. We talk of dignity and what has to be dealt with it. And these are, I'm not going to deal in detail with this. But it also talks, one of the judgments from the Kerala High Court, which deals with the circus animal, talks of this. Though not homo sapiens, they are also beings entitled to dignified existence. 
And let me tell you, the word dignity is very flexible, is very elastic, and it has been used all over the world. It's one of the new concepts in the last two decades which is being used to expand the meaning of the right to life. Okay, that's one. Then there are another few judgments. I'm not reading them out. This is the one, again, about captivity, how the high court deals with it. Then one from Manilal about the elephant. Uh, same thing, I'm not getting into detail. Now, what I want to get into is the issue of, the key issue. In the last two years, the Supreme Court has been dealing with a number of issues. The last one being the Section 377, which is about gay rights, homosexuality. Section 377. Right from the privacy issue to Navte Johar, which is the 377 case, the court has been trying to understand what is our constitution all about. So it has looked into the preamble and the fundamental rights and has said, by the way, these slides are available, there's no copyright on it, so you can take them and, but please do not use them as final slides, these are draft thinking. Um, what they have said is the preamble read with fundamental rights are the key principles which the Constitution is supposed to get to in terms of our society must reach a goal and the guiding lights or the guiding beacons are the preamble and the fundamental rights. What does it mean? As the preamble says, we have to achieve justice which is political, economic and social, okay? It has to be with equality and non-discrimination. There has to be dignity, privacy, autonomy and self-determination. Of course, we, they are only talking of human beings. Remember that. And we have to expand that into animals. And very importantly, like Ashish said, plurality and inclusiveness. So plurality means what? Our society is not one group. It is multiple groups, multiple religions, multiple cultures, multiple languages. That is the meaning of plurality and inclusive nature. Freedom of association and choice of partners. If I want to marry a person from another religion, if I'm an adult, I can do that. That's Hadiya's case. Now, these principles are the ones which guide the state. They will be the guiding factor, mandatory guiding factors for the court to decide constitutional issues. And this is known as constitutional morality. Okay? My morality or some section's morality that a person should not do anything is not relevant for constitutional issues. It is constitutional morality, which is this. So divisive politics, divisive rule is not part of our constitution. This is not a message only for animal rights. It's a message for the whole of society. And this has been emphasized in now eight judgments. And very importantly, in this context, how does it apply to animals? So, Personhood is more than the ability to sue and be sued. So as I said, the minimal thing is, I'll, I'll say, I'll sue in the name of the elephant. What is the name of the elephant? X. I can go to court and say X. Elephant is the person who's the plaintiff or the defendant, like we do in admiralty law, or we do in, on behalf of a deity of a temple. So the most famous case, His Holiness, Holiness Keshavananda Bharati was a deity of a temple, okay? So we can sue in the name of the deity because that has personhood. But that is not sufficient. So we have to go beyond Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And the road, as I see it, is to use the basis of constitutional morality and argue on the same issue. Is an animal entitled to autonomy? Is an animal entitled to privacy? And that's what the High Court judgments, which I didn't read out, talk about. So if an animal is in captivity in a... In a, in a temple, can the animal, he or she, be released into the wild? Yes, because they have a right to be, if they have a personhood, they will have that right in terms of a constitutional law. That is what we have to articulate in courts. They have the right to liberty in their own wild terrain or habitat. Do they have a right to fraternity? Yes, fraternity means being with their own people. Like, I have a fraternal relations with human beings. Do they have a freedom of association? Yes, because animals run in groups. So they can be returned to nature, to their own habitat, and be free. 
That is the way I look at in the future, how things can actually work. So I want to stop here because I was limited in time and I've stuck to my time of 15 minutes. Okay. Um, just a very few things. I, I, I'm feeling a little odd being squashed between two legal luminaries like this. But from my side, I just want to present a picture of why did we choose the elephant. So when we had a um, discussion on this a few months back, there was hardly any uh, difference of opinion because I think automatically everyone felt that elephant was one animal that was acceptable to multiple um, communities, religion, uh, across India, cross uh, um, culture, and that there was one animal that nobody could raise an objection to because it was considered auspicious and holy in almost all the, in almost all the religions of India. Second point was that it is an animal that is widely taken to be a very, very long living and a wise animal and its years of life parallels the human life. So an animal, elephant matures from five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, the same way as a young human adult would mature and his old age would come at 70, 75, that's about it that an elephant may live. Human, of course, is now going on to live to 100. But it's, it's uh, development of brain, it's development of body, maturity, experience, all parallels the human body and mind. Third thing is that the brain is so well developed, like a human brain is in proportion to the human body much larger than any other mammal, so is the elephant's brain much larger in proportion to its body than any other mammal. And it has tremendous uh, uh, quality of filtering information, um, guarding experiences, remembering, processing, and it is, the mind is as complex as a human mind. Then they have the very, very important function that ecologically an elephant is a very significant animal. The forests are made with an elephant's dung with an elephant's feeding habits, with its biological propensity to keep on feeding, eating, and fertilizing its nature's gardeners. The seeds propagate in the forest thanks to an elephant, its feeding habits, and the habits of the vast distances it traverses through corridors. If, if the elephant dies out, with it will die a part of our forests because the diversity of tree Diversity of environment is because of an elephant. Elephant's dung also is like a microcosm of small ecosystem, gives a lot of nutrients back to the soil, back to insects, back to... So in most cases, in ecologically, culturally, um, uh, family-wise, uh, its relationship with its family members, it, the complex herd um, requirements of the females living together for, for lifetime, the males having clan relationship amongst, uh, 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 um, within a group of elephants that separate clans. And <coughs> the elephant after years recognizes other family members that it comes to. So in every way, elephant was the most suitable, least objectionable. Perhaps the case may be thrown out at first instance because a similar case has now been filed in Connecticut, sir. That um, it is a petting zoo of Connecticut they have filed the petition, uh, writ, uh, he, writ of hibis corpus. And for three zoo elephants, they have wanted, on this petition, they have requested those animals to be released back into a natural environment. This happened earlier this year. And so already a precedent is being set. And maybe we will continue the precedent and fortunately we may, we may be lucky like, you know, the other judgments, this, we may, each step is a step forward, taking it forward for the elephant. And then we'll see what happens to the other animals. But f as far as the elephant is concerned, it's supremely placed in the position to be the animal if there are legal rights given or even co thought about or uh, contemplated for a, it should be this particular animal because of how significant it is in our lives and in the forest. Thank you. I've got such a wonderful set of panelists. Nobody is even crossing a minute more. I've never had such disciplined panelists before. 
Anyway, <laughs> but, but, there's time, there's time. We got 22 minutes I can see on that clock. So, before I throw it open, Anand stopped short of answering many things, but he said that's because I was sitting here and howling away on time. So, I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to send Anand back to the podium to answer them and then you think of the questions that you want. Anand, I got a couple of questions. One is which you didn't answer and, I, and we did want um, a sort of an answer from you. According to you, would, if we took the matter to, co to court, uh, would elephants qualify to be recognized as persons? What, is, what would be your, your, your guess? And I mean, they always come to lawyers to say, what are the chances? So how good do you think our chances? Supriya is already saying maybe we won't win, but I am kind of, you know, always fight for, for win. I don't go for second. The second thing I wanted to ask you is, rights normally is accompanied by duties. How would one juxtapose rights and duties in the case of elephants? Or can we have limited personhood which means that you are a person to this extent and there are certain aspects which don't apply. Like when you talk of deities and so on, there are certain, you, you are in a certain limited uh, context of personhood. And the third thing that I wanted to ask you, and here I'm sort of bargaining for more, do you think all animals should get? Uh, Ashish in the, mo I think it was Ashish or was it Melanie, I don't know, one of them talked about uh, why do we, uh, we, we we pick up certain animals saying they are like us. I think it was Ashish who said that. Uh, they are like us in so many qualities. They love and they uh, care for their young and so on. But why should everything be like us in order to qualify uh, for, uh, for this status of personhood? Of course, personhood means persons. But as, and as uh, Supriya also said that she said uh, they are so very much, you know, they, uh, they, are, they think and so on and so forth. So do you think dogs, horses, mice, birds, should we, should we go for everyone? <coughs> Not in the first instance, but do you think this person concept goes wide or should it be restricted? Well, Norma, I didn't answer that question in the, the morning session. The uh, Uttaranchal High Court has already so-called conferred legal personhood to animals. So we are not doing something completely new. And just see, it says, I'm just going to read it out. This is Narayanda Tavbat versus Union of India. Multiplicity of animal beings with whom we share our world deserve to be treated not as a means to human ends, but as a means, in a, means as ends in, in themselves. Having arrogated to ourselves complete power over animal kin, their liberation rests in our hands. So we are talking about freedom of animals. Then, all animals have honor and dignity. So it's honor and dignity which is the fulcrum and the base of it. Every species has an inherent right to live and are required to be protected by law. The rights and privacy of animals are to be respected and protected from unlawful attacks. So if they are in their own private habitat, they can actually exercise those rights. The entire animal kingdom, including avian and aquatic, are declared as legal entities having distinct persona with corresponding rights, duties, and liabilities of a living person. Now, this is a very, very broad statement, but it has already been conferred by one high court. Whether the Supreme Court agrees? Not stayed. There was a portion which was stayed. Yeah. Yes. So, the question is whether this will be taken. Now, to answer your question, whether we should actually take only one because they're like animals, uh, they're like human beings, it's a question of tactics. But the real thing is, what is the constitutional value of it? And the constitutional value of it is to understand this is trying to frame a goal of a society which will respect nature, animals, and human beings in a particular relationship, which Ashish talked. And I'm not positing any particular type. But we have to be able to come to an understanding that there is indeed a relationship between all three entities which will be sustainable for centuries. We haven't done that. We have actually been destroying that. So that is one point. So this is a road to development. Okay? Because if we want to have a sustainable development, that's the question I asked Ashish, we have to decide what should be the interrelationship with these three entities. Whether we take it against a quay one animal or all the kingdom of animals or plant species, that's a different question. 
I think it's easy to get personhood. It's not a difficult issue. But what does it entail? And that is the vexed question. What are the rights and liabilities? And I don't think we can predicate that right now. But we can certainly state, like for example, uh, in, the, in the Act, the Wildlife Act, they have given you the a protocol of declaring an animal who's a man-eater. Okay? Things like that. If that happens, there is an obligation and a duty cast on the animal. What rights are available and what rights are extinct at a particular time. So you can have that. But within their own habitat, the animals will, ha will be able to live in the way they live in, in, the, in, in nature. Whether they kill one other animal or not, that is how they live. We can't predicate that. So the purpose of having personhood is to allow, like in Connecticut, to sue and get that person, person I'm saying, not an animal, released on a habeas corpus. Now, whether the courts accept it or not, it's a different issue. You have to think in the long term and focus on it and then whether it takes five years or 10 years, I think it's possible to get it. But the crucial question will not be to getting, get personhood. The crucial question will be what are the rights and liabilities. And of course, those who want to do mining, those who want to destroy forests will be opposed to us. So it won't be an easy fight. Today we are in very comfortable surroundings where even the people who are destroying forests, they don't mind having a pet dog and treating them without cruelty. That's perfectly okay. But as you know, more and more animals are being killed today than ever before. So how do we actually come to a, an equilibrium where this would not happen in the future? Last question, yours. No, no, I'll ask about duties. Ah, so the duties cannot be defined in the abstract. That's what I was trying to say. That is the most difficult question. Have I answered all yes, three? Yes, you've answered all three. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so I'm now yeah, against us uh, are all the people who want to, um, you know, wipe out the habitats of the animals and uh, the wildlife areas and so on. Okay, with this uh, very um, scintillating, I would say, presentation and very thought-provoking ideas which are before you, I hope you have questions and I'm ready to take them. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm, I can't, I'm, I can't I'm see my light, the, the lights in my eyes. So so. I'm going to take the advantage of the being All right. and uh, ask the first question. Yeah. Uh, it is that, you know, if uh, elephants or other animals do get personhood and the courts are very generous with that, then like Anand said before, that in terms of their duties or them getting sued, you know, would it also put them in, you know, under scrutiny where people can misuse and say that, say, Lakshmi the elephant killed so and so people, and would that jeopardize, you know, I mean, their, I mean, their rights or, or, or they can, you know, then be said that, you know, a death penalty or something like yeah. that. Okay. Any other questions? I'll take three, four at a time. Okay. One, two, three. You got a mic or something? Uh, somebody give a mic here. In New York Supreme Court, I think in the March 2017, the Supreme Court has heard uh, for the personhood for the two chimps, uh, chimpanzees. In chimpanzees, I really don't know the judgment of that case. Is, did ever in the world, in any country, has given personhood to any animal? Okay, next question. Somebody else behind? Yeah. Uh, so when you, when you say personhood, and it means it gets the same rights as humans, would the killing of an animal be called murder or will it continue to be called killing? Okay, somebody here. Yeah. We got a wonderful verdict from Nantal High Court uh, regarding personhood for the whole animal kingdom. Uh, government is not that comfortable and already deb debate is going on in the state government itself that should we go for SLP. How can we uh, convince our government not to go for SLP? Not to go for, what's your last word? SLP. 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 Um, yeah, well, the one country that I know of which has given personhood to animal is New Zealand for gorillas. 
mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas, yeah, all gorillas. Yeah. Well, um, uh, but I know, just want to say, sir, sorry. that it's easy for a country to give when they don't have the animal living there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Subana. Now, Abod asked a very important question, and actually, it follows on to the question that other the friend asked. See, any when you when you are when you can sue, you have rights. When you can be uh, sued, you have duties. So once the rights and duties have been cast, then you can be sued. So if an animal uh, becomes unruly, you know, and in the not natural habitat, an animal may become unruly. For example, those judgments, which I didn't read out, high court judgment, if the elephant is actually tied in a, in a temple and it's going through a particular period, then the animal may become angry, etc., violent, but that would happen in a particular circumstance. If we don't understand that, then he may actually kill a person. Would that amount to murder? But that depends on the root, the duties and the rights that are cast or conferred or obligations that are cast. So you have to understand that in a non-natural environment, the situation will be very different. Now, the problem is, how do you make sure that the, the animals live in their natural environment, okay? And if they live in their natural environment, can you make sure then that they don't get out of their natural environment where they will not be able to exist in the in the in the in the, in the, the way they exist naturally, and then commit an act which would be in violation of their duties, like for example, an animal killing a human being, would that amount to murder? It won't amount to murder because murder specifically with an intention, you know, uh, murder means in fact that there is an intention to kill or doing an act with the knowledge that it will kill another person. Now, obviously, the, the animal doesn't know that, so it doesn't amount to murder. But you can cast the duties in a particular way, which means that if the, if the animal does those things, trespasses those duties, then the, then the animal could be confined or what have you, or relegated back to the habitat with the no prospect of coming into contact with human beings. But th that, th no, I'm coming. I'm coming to that. Just one minute. Would it amount to murder, as I understand it? No, no, I'll come to that. If a man killed an animal, yeah, if the duty is on a human, on a human, like Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Yeah, no, no, one minute. See, like today, if I commit act of cruelty, I have actually committed an offense for which I am penalized. So similarly, duties will be cast and corresponding rights on animals, which will define those on the basis of which we can act. Now, this becomes a major problem. Only right to be sued and being sued is different from casting duties on each animal. What are the obligations? Whether they would, uh, that would amount to a particular offense. That's why we can actually uh, confer a right to, of personhood to all animals. But what are the duties that we cast? On a cockroach, for example, can we say a cockroach should not enter my kitchen? And if it enters my kitchen, I will not kill it. Now that becomes a problematic. It's not the problem of having personhood alone. So I am a person, I am a person, Indian citizen. A citizen has one right, set of rights. A non-citizen has a different set of rights. Both are persons in law. What rights you confer depends on how the state looks at that particular animal. So they need not be uniform set of rights. That's the difference. So it's not an issue of personhood at all. It is an issue of what sort of rights and duties you confer. So if, for example, a virus comes or a bacteria come, they're also animals, they cause disease. Necessarily, you have to exterminate them. HIV virus, you can't say, I'm sorry, you have to protect them, okay? So those rights and obligations are different. So we are talking of animals who, which will have, who will have rights and duties, and therefore you'll have to differentiate. Though you can give personhood not only to one particular species or one particular individual species of them, or also to the collective of species, a collective right. That depends on how you figure it out. So personhood is not an issue. It's the question of what type of rights and duties you cast. Those are the critical questions. Okay, any questions from this side? Yeah, um, one. Hi. Anybody else? Two. Okay, go ahead. Um, 
I understand that rights and duties are separate from personhood, but the whole purpose of personhood is these rights and duties. And how are we going to identify what these rights and duties are? And let's say we do. Let's say we identify a very basic right, because the identification of separate rights for multiple species is a huge, huge task, and it's not simple to do. And my guess is that if we were to go to a court, their first question is, how do you identify these rights and duties, right? I mean, that's my presumption. I could be wrong. How do we plan on identifying them? And how do we um, explain and eventually extend these rights to animals that we currently use, like farmed animals? And is it likely that because we're uncertain of what these rights and duties are, that courts may also be uncertain of how this will perhaps extend to other animals in the future, like farmed animals? And how are these concerns um, currently planned on being dealt to it, is my okay, question. Over there, the back. Can we uh, declare as a vegan or person? And on the other side, we are looking at these animals as a vermin, and government is coming up with the fast, with the, you know, vermin law, monkey, nil guy, wild boar, and even elephant in some states. So how we are going to do a balance here? No, I didn't understand. What is the second sentence? Second the vermin, part? they declare animal as a vermin, and... Uh, government is declaring animals as vermin, vermin. under agricultural okay. law. Yeah. Okay. okay, over there there was somebody else. The right to life and personhood of the elephant, and one's right to freedom of practice, freedom of religion, which would gain ascendance, because that is the problem people like Suparna, all of us are having, that uh, the elephant comes directly in to contact with the right to religion, which says that an elephant is necessary. OK. Uh, the lady's question there. Can I, you know, can I make uh, one more comment? Sorry. The, la the question there about the precise nature of rights. See, already there are rights under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. So the cruelty which is specified is an obligation on human beings not to perpetrate cruelty and the corresponding right to animals. And if you read Nagaraja, that is specifically stated. That's how the rights and duties operate. Now, you can say all animals have personhood. So you can sue on their behalf. The question will be, at certain times, the obligation, as in the Wildlife Act, talk about declaring certain animals as vermins. Then, they ex then their rights get extinguished. That's also a mode of defining rights and obligations. So you have to decide what sort of rights. Now, if they are declared as vermin, as one set of uh, uh, three sets of animals were, we could not get protection for them in the Supreme Court. So we have to decide how we define those rights. Now, that is a conflict between nature animals and human beings because of extension or denudation of forests. In my opinion, the question is really selecting the elephant because it's an easy task. We start addressing their rights, and it's easy to address rights if we say they have a right to their own habitat. That's the easiest one. Dignity and their right to their own habitat and not being confined by human beings in captivity. That's the overall generic right to be able to exist in their natural habitat. And within that, you can specify certain rights, like the Wildlife Act also does, and the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act also does. But the obligation of the animal not to be, or rather the right actually being extinguished, happens when there's a declaration. Now, the animal doesn't have a right to be heard on that. Human beings have a right to be heard. If they are declared as persons, then we can even move the court and say, but before you declared, you did not give me a hearing. Like, for example, right now, there's a tigress in Maharashtra. They, uh, huh? Amni. So she has been declared as a man-eater. When I argued the matter before the Supreme Court, I said the precise procedure they have followed is faulty. And she could not have declared a man-eater. In fact, after she's been declared, she has not done anything to, to even indicate that she's a man-eater. So if she were a person in law, we could have argued that I should have been given a hearing. So a lot of other things come in before you declare. Now there's no procedure for the animal to be heard. So these are things that you get as an additional thing. Religious practice. Now, under the Constitution, religious practice subject to other articles in the Constitution or other fundamental rights 
can be practiced, propagated, and professed in our country. Moreover, every religion, including all minority religions, have the fundamental right, unlike in any other country in the world. This is very important. The US doesn't have it. Britain doesn't have a written constitution. Europe only has a convention. We have been very particular because we understand the plural nature of our country, different religions. So all religious institutions have the right to establish their religious institution and practice and profess their, and propagate their faith. So religious institutions, if they're only carrying out religious work, that cannot be interfered by the state. They can only interfere in terms of what are called secular practices. Like, are you giving a person wages, etc.? So now, that is one part. The other thing is to be able to set up religious minority and linguistic minority institutions. Now, can you in interfere with religious practice? Then, on that issue, the Supreme Court has said, if it is the core of your religious practice, you cannot interfere. So, Sabri Mala, for example, whether women can enter the Sabri Mala temple, according to the Supreme Court, it is not part of the core practice, and it violates, because the right to religion is subject to equality and not discrimination of women, and that was a rule in Sabri Mala, which did not allow women to enter the temple because they were uh, menstruating between the age of 10 and 50, they were not allowed to enter. The Supreme Court said that is not constitutional. So your right to religion or practice religion is subject to other fundamental rights of equality. Now, if it is not core part of your religion, like having a, an elephant, is it the core part of your religious belief? If it is not, then the question doesn't arise. And you know it is not. So I don't think that would be a major problem. But suppose somebody were to argue, like they could have a, a, an elephant as a deity, you know, and they held the elephant as captive person. And they would say, no, it's our core belief. Like in Sabra Malai, the deity is supposed to be celibate. So you can have a deity as an elephant, and the deity will, will be an elephant who is held captive. That could be a core part of the religion. Then only you can argue that you cannot interfere with that, and you cannot release that person. So that is the broad way of understanding religious practice going other. Then the competition will be between the right of the animal to be freed, which is also a fundamental right, because the animal is entitled to right to life with dignity. Okay? And competing with that is the religious practice of a, say, Anand Grover, who wants to hold the animal captive. And the two competing interests will be balanced by the court, and then decision will be made. Have I answered your question? Thank you. Okay, um, I have one more question, Anand. Very tricky question. What You're always happens? asking tricky questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know you well, that's why. Um, uh, what happens if we argue for personhood for an animal which we eat? What would happen to food, slaughter laws? Mm -hmm. What would happen to the exception that is made uh, to cruelty, which is accepting for food. How would, how would that so work? So that will be one very crucial part of defining the rights of animals and the corresponding duties of human beings. So when you decide that the animal has a right to personhood, they have the right to liberty, privacy, right to life, then you decide, like the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, actually makes an exception saying that for food, of for mankind, you can kill, okay? And Justice Radha Krishnan in Nagaraja makes it very clear that you can destroy animals only on an exceptional basis for food again as a necessity. Now the question is, though in the judgment, it talks of necessity. Is it a necessity? Should that be the, the, the mandate of law? Obviously you can't do that. Because there are a large number of people who will say, I don't want to agree with you. And we have to understand Though I may want it, another people do not want it. So we have to appreciate the plural nature of our society and we cannot impose our ideas, though they may be the best. They may be supported by religion, sanction, and tell people, no, you must do this. For centuries, people have been eating meat. So we'll have to define the rights of animals, we human beings, and maybe in a democratic way, where the rights of minorities are protected. Please understand, the rights of minorities are protected under the constitutional morality principle. The majority in your rule cannot be the basis of a constitutional morality. That is the mandate of the constitutional court. 
So we'll have to decide in a very fine-tuned manner how to protect the rights of those people who don't agree with us. And therefore, we can say that if you want to eat meat, then you have to practice certain rules. There is no cruelty, etc., etc., like the rules that are applicable in slaughterhouses. So we make an exception, maybe for certain type of food, which is agreed by everybody. But I think it has to be a very delicate way of doing it, where other people's views are respected. Okay. Norma, may I make my point? Sorry, Norma. I'm holding the mic for a while. Where, who's the other? Uh, uh, we have a parallel of, uh, with the elephant issue. It's actually children. Because children are legal persons, but they can't represent themselves. So somebody has to represent the children. And we have failed miserably in representing the children. And children are exploited uh, despite having legal personhood. So the law, so we have the best interest of the child. I mean, it's a very important doctrine which has really guided the courts to decide how to help the child because the child can't represent itself. Now, the elephant is not going to represent itself, right? Because we'll give the elephant the rights, but it'll, it'll, it'll still be an interaction between a human and another human. It's very important to understand that because we will give the rights to the elephant, and I understand that, and I think it's a great idea. But in the end, the interest of the elephant will be represented and articulated by a human person. So how do we decide who represents the elephant after that? Will it be a committee of people? Will it be rules? Or will it be a doctrine? Because it is, I mean, I, I'm just wondering in my head, because, you know, we'll, I mean, this is fantastic, right? Maybe we'll fight this for 15 years, and, and elephants will be recognized as legal persons. And then, how will they fight for their rights? It'll be a person. So now we may disagree with somebody coming up with an issue with the elephants. I mean, I don't know. So the idea is, how do we, I think we should have the discussion right now itself. How does the elephant also represent itself? Is it a board? Is, are there people? Or is it a doctrine? Because the children example, I think, is a very notable example. Because the best interest of the child pretty much guides everything now on uh, any court law discussion on children. I, I mean, I thought I'd just put it there. Sorry, thanks. OK, uh, look, just quick thing is that children are recognized as human beings which, who have rights, OK? Now, the doctrine of deciding the issue is the doctrine of best interest of the child. We haven't evolved that doctrine as far as animals are concerned. That it's left to the courts or statutory principle which could be. Uh, utilized. But in terms of representation, the better example would be public interest litigation. Now you will say, who will represent the public interest of the environment, which is so broad? Now, anybody can do it. I don't think we should have a fetish of deciding. You can do that by rules, or you can allow uh, the court to be approached by any person who has an interest, like we do in public interest litigation, which is loose, which allows anybody to come in. If you have a statute, it confines because you're actually representing those who cannot represent themselves. So the, it should be broad rather than narrow. Whereas in case of children, you have to show a direct interest and there are statutory rules in uh, terms of POXO, in terms of uh, Juvenile Justice Act, which is narrow because not anybody can represent children. I think it's better in the case of animals that there is much more loose like in the PR. But these are for discussion. We can't predicate on this right now. I think a lot of these issues will come up when things are actually fine-tuned. So this has been an, I think, very stimulating, exciting, thought-provoking session. We are bang on time. Oh, well, we went a little bit ahead, but uh, according to that, that board, we are OK on time. And I want to thank my co-panelists, Suparna and uh, Anand, and especially Anand. I'm sure Suparna will agree with me. Double thanks is due to Anand, because we have got all the legal knowledge for free, so to speak. We've asked all the questions. We've not paid him for this information. And I'm sure we're going to go back to him to fight the case also. So thank you very much, Anand, for your assistance. Thank you, Suparna. Thank you, all of you. So, so thank you, Anand, Suparna, and Norma. And I'd like Varda to, we are token of appreciation.